Hi everyone! I recently got a huge influx of subs thanks to Thought Slime, so welcome if you're new here. And I know you can't see my shirt in the frame, but it's one of my favorites. <laughs> Anyways, for those of you who are new here and don't know, there's a debate going on in the vegan community about whether or not it's appropriate to compare human and animal suffering and use words like slavery, rape, and holocaust to describe the plight of animals. Keep in mind, this isn't new. This debate has been going on for years and years. Of course, I have to start with about a million disclaimers. One, there are many people who I deeply respect who don't agree with my stance on this issue. I recognize that not everyone who disagrees with me is engaging in toxic shaming and cancel culture. Second, I do not stand by everything James and those who have taken his side have said and done. I think there are valid criticisms of their behavior. And third, I do not take pride in offending people. I'm not one to be like, I don't give a fuck about your feelings. I do take people's feelings into consideration. But there are some cases where I feel like sharing the truth takes precedence over sparing people's feelings. And lastly, please watch the whole video as I discuss tactful versus tactless use of these terms. I don't entirely disagree with the opposition. That said, with the way this debate has been unfolding on Instagram, I feel like I'm not allowed to have this opinion. It's not the politically correct opinion. There's so much pressure to just nod along or else you'll be branded as problematic. But in my opinion, the rhetoric I see from those who vehemently oppose the use of these terms is problematic. I believe their position on this particular issue is inconsistent with their calls for consistent anti-oppression, and I will outline my reasons. I want to start out by saying that in discussing this concept of human supremacy, I'm not equating humans and non-human animals. The differences between humans and non-humans are greater than the differences between racial groups, genders, or sexual orientations. To argue for animal rights is not to argue that non-human animals should have all the same rights as humans. Animal rights advocates are pushing for basic rights for non-human animals, such as bodily autonomy and a healthy environment. But many things we consider to be basic human rights, like education, freedom of assembly, or the right to vote, don't apply to non-human animals. It wouldn't make sense to extend such rights to other species. Non-human animals are significantly different from us in many regards, which is why I wouldn't equate humans and non-humans. And likewise, I wouldn't equate a dog with a fruit fly. The problem is that we're so focused on all of our differences that we fail to recognize our similarities. The question is not, can they reason, nor can they talk, but can they suffer? And the answer is a resounding yes to any creature with a brain and central nervous system. I understand that throughout history, marginalized people have been dehumanized compared to animals. So animal rights advocates are often cautioned against using terminology and imagery that compares the suffering of animals to the suffering of marginalized people. I recognize the importance of approaching this topic with caution, but I think ultimately this speaks to how pervasive speciesism is in our society. When the concept of human rights was defended in the late 1700s, in Thomas Paine's Rights of Man and Mary Wollstonecraft's A Vindication of the Rights of Women, Thomas Taylor wrote a satirical essay titled A Vindication of the Rights of Brutes, arguing that if we were to grant legal rights to men and women, we would have to grant rights to animals. His conclusion, though, was that the concept of animal rights is so absurd that the argument for human rights must be flawed. His conclusion is disturbing, but his reasoning is valid. Animal rights are the logical extension of human rights. This is demonstrated in Peter Singer's argument from marginal cases. Basically, if we're going to claim that humans are superior in value to non-human animals because of our superior cognitive abilities, we would have to accept that people on the margins, who have limited cognitive abilities, are inferior in value. If we're going to exclude non-human animals from our moral consideration on the basis of inferior intellect, we would have to exclude people with severe cognitive disabilities as well. In other words, speciesism is a form of ableism. Compassionate people feel that we have a moral duty 
to protect the most vulnerable members of our society, such as children, the elderly, and the disabled. It's a child's innocence that makes us especially horrified when harm is done to them. Human supremacy is represented in our disregard for the most vulnerable and innocent among us, non-human animals. There have been many holocausts throughout history, including the Armenian Holocaust and the British Indian Holocaust. The Armenian Holocaust partly inspired the Jewish Holocaust, and it is not even recognized as a holocaust by many governments, including the Israeli government. This is deeply offensive to Armenians, and understandably so. Jewish people do not own the word, and insisting that they do is racist and Western-centric. If you agree that this term is technically correct, but disagree with its usage from a strategic standpoint, stick with me, because I'll address strategy later. I won't be making fallacious appeals to definition here. An appeal to definition is using a dictionary's limited definition of a term as evidence that the term cannot have another meaning, expanded meaning, or even conflicting meaning. This is a fallacy because dictionaries don't reason. They simply are a reflection of an abbreviated version of the current accepted usage of a term, as determined by argumentation and eventual acceptance. In short, dictionaries tell you what a word meant according to the authors at the time of its writing, not what it meant before that time, after, or what it should mean. Dictionary meanings are usually concise and lack the depth found in an encyclopedia. Therefore, terms found in dictionaries are often incomplete when it comes to helping people gain a full understanding of the term. The logical form is denoted as, the dictionary definition of x does not mention y. Therefore, y must not be a part of x. Carnists often appeal to the dictionary to debunk the notion that meat is murder, because murder is currently defined as the unlawful premeditated killing of one human being by another. They are saying, the dictionary definition of murder does not mention animals, therefore, meat must not be murder. But language evolves. We're not arguing that meat is considered murder, we're arguing that it should be considered murder. Again, dictionary definitions are determined by argumentation and eventual acceptance. It's true that the word holocaust is defined as slaughter on a mass scale, and there's no denying that what we do to animals is slaughter on a mass scale. But even if it were defined as slaughter of human beings on a mass scale, I would argue that the definition should be expanded to include non-human animals. The current definition of slave is a person who is the legal property of another and forced to obey them. I would argue that many non-human animals, excluding bivalves and sponges, fit the criteria for legal personhood status as they are sentient individuals. To those saying there are other words, call it genocide. I would argue that this word is less fitting, as the commonly accepted definition implies the intent to eradicate, whereas Holocaust does not. Any mass slaughter or reckless destruction of life is a current commonly accepted definition of Holocaust. If you want to argue that the definition of genocide should include animals, and the intent is not meaningful, go right ahead. But I don't know why you want to expand the definition of genocide, but constrict the definition of Holocaust. Seeking to exclude an oppressed group from one of the few spaces where they linguistically belong is the opposite of progressive. The very people who argue for inclusivity, and I'm talking about victims of oppression here, innocent animals, not oppressors, insist that words like slavery, rape, and holocaust should be exclusive to the human race. This is blatant speciesism. Raising the status of non-human animals does not lower the status of marginalized humans. One powerful mechanism of racism, the animalization of people of color, only works in a speciesist framework. If non-human animals were elevated and given personhood status, this particular mechanism would fail. I'm not saying that speciesism is the root of all oppression. Racism, sexism, transphobia, etc. could still theoretically exist in the absence of speciesism. In fact, they exist to some degree within the vegan movement. But speciesism is fuel for oppressive ideologies. The main argument I've seen against the use of these terms is fallacious. It's an appeal to emotion and or an appeal to popularity. Many people find these words offensive, therefore it is wrong to use them. But offense is subjective. We have to ask ourselves, why does it offend people? The N-word, for example, is understandably offensive as it's a derogatory slur. 
It serves no other purpose, therefore it should not be used. Same goes for other slurs, like the F slur and the R slur. But in this case, words like slavery, rape, and holocaust are not being used as a slur. They're not being used to offend. They're being used to accurately describe the plight of non-human animals and convey the severity of the issue. They're not offensive because extending these terms to non-human animals carries underlying racism, sexism, or anti-Semitism. They're offensive because we live in a speciesist society. They're only offensive in a speciesist framework. To dare suggest that non-human animals deserve moral consideration, let alone personhood status, is offensive in our culture. How many times have you triggered an emotional response in someone despite avoiding inflammatory language? Yes, words like slavery, rape, and holocaust are particularly provocative, but I would argue that this is precisely what makes them so powerful and effective when used with tact. My issue isn't with the suggestion that these words should be avoided in certain contexts from a strategic standpoint. My issue is with the insistence that these words are off-limits and shouldn't be used in any context. And this is what a concerning number of people within the vegan community are saying. I agree that it's super important to listen to people with marginalized identities, but here's the thing. They don't all agree. For example, right-wingers like Candace Owens claim that anti-racist rhetoric is racist. Just because a black woman says something is racist doesn't mean that it is, clearly. People accuse Ilhan Omar of being anti-Semitic for criticizing Israel. This is why we should listen to opposing perspectives, evaluate the merits of their arguments, and use discernment. It's a double standard to say, amplify marginalized voices with the asterisk, but only those who agree with me. If you want to advance anti-racism, you have to provide an actual argument for why something is racist. You can't just insist it's racist because members of X racial groups say so. Open-minded people are persuaded by compelling arguments, not demands. We can just as easily point to members of said race who agree with us, and that would be a poor argument. Some argue that these words are technically accurate, but because of the response they elicit, shouldn't be used. I agree with this sentiment in certain contexts. For example, juxtaposing imagery of concentration camps with factory farms and putting it on a billboard or sharing it as a meme where nuance is lacking is insensitive and ineffective in my opinion. During the BLM protests, I shared a close-up image of George Floyd with Derek Chauvin's knee on his neck, and I took it down after reading commentary about how sharing images without a graphic warning does nothing but re-traumatize black people. Yes, we should share information and links as it's important for white people to bear witness to police brutality, but we don't need to plaster it on social media in a way that only upsets vulnerable people and doesn't really add to the conversation. Showing graphic images and footage of animals is different because the victims are not exposed to these images, they're not being re-traumatized by them. And this is something that the public is largely unaware of and needs to be shown. The Vietnam War was the first war to be broadcast on TV, and the shocking nature of such imagery is what propelled the anti-war movement. Slaughterhouse footage is compelling on its own, though. It doesn't need to be juxtaposed with images of human tragedies. Such a juxtaposition, done in this way, offers a convenient distraction. Most people will take offense rather than take in what they're seeing. I also agree that direct parallels to slavery and the Holocaust are much more powerful when they're coming from those who have experienced oppression themselves. Which is why I choose to amplify the voices of people like Alex Hershaft and Isaac Bashevis Singer. Some argue that this is tokenism, but I don't see how. I'm sharing their work to advance the cause of animal rights, not to undermine the fight against anti-Semitism. For it to be tokenism, it would have to be anti-Semitic, and again, I haven't seen a compelling argument for why it is anti-Semitic to say that non-human animals are worthy of accurate and honest terminology. I also want to highlight the work of Christopher Sebastian, someone who is very tactful in their approach. Speciesists are so used to depersonizing as opposed to dehumanizing non-human animals and minimizing their trauma, experiences of violence, and lived experience in general that they cannot comprehend non-human animals as marginalized people. We aren't allowed to use these terms because they are racist or sexist or traumatic, when this simply wouldn't be a discussion in regards to humans. That is the low moral level which non-human people are at in the human psyche. 
We must navigate emotional discussion with care. But non-human animals are enslaved. They are exploited, they are raped, they are chased, and they are murdered. They are tortured. Speciesist violence, like all violence directed at a marginalized group, is very intense, harrowing, and heartbreaking to witness. But these truthful terms belong to non-human animals, and we should not deny them their reality. Anyway, back to being right versus being effective. I would argue that it is extremely effective, if done with caution and tact, to call the situation what it is. I remember in college, when I was transitioning to veganism, I saw this quote. What do they know? All these scholars, all these philosophers, all the leaders of the world. They have convinced themselves that man, the worst transgressor of all the species, is the crown of creation. All other creatures were created merely to provide him with food, pelts, to be tormented, exterminated. In relation to them, all people are Nazis. For the animals, it is an eternal Treblinka. This struck a major chord with me. The way we're taught history in school, we're led to believe that World War II and the Civil Rights Movement was this great triumph over evil. Like, we won, it's done, it's in the past. But that quote made me realize that we are currently living in history, and I was actively participating in a holocaust. Like, holy fuck. All this talk of this type of language diminishing the suffering of Jews, women, and black people is nonsense. This is the same argument that conservative Christians made against marriage equality. That allowing same-sex couples to get married would diminish the sanctity of marriage. You are diminishing the suffering of animals by insisting that these words are off-limits. All this talk of language is important. Yes, I agree. That is why I believe it is so important to use these words, again, with tact, and expand our language to be more inclusive. To those who argue that it's unnecessary, I disagree. I believe it is necessary to use powerful and provocative language, so long as it's accurate, to shift the Overton window. If you don't want to, you don't have to, but stop policing others. To those saying that there's no evidence that this type of rhetoric is effective, I would push back on that. Gary Yurofsky, as problematic as some of the stuff he said elsewhere is, made quite a large impact. There's no denying that his speech, where he compares factory farms to concentration camps, and asks the question, if they're not enslaved, what are they? Free? Was effective. So many people cite that speech as what turned them vegan. It went viral for a reason. And anecdotally, that quote by Isaac Bashevis Singer had a huge impact on me. To argue that this speech and that quote have done more harm than good is a bold claim that would be very hard to defend, in my opinion. I believe that delivering a clear, consistent, and powerful message is what will best serve animals. Insisting that these words are off-limits is inconsistent with the narrative of total liberation, as it upholds speciesism. Lastly, I just want to complain about SJWs for a minute. I do not align myself with the anti-intersectional, veganism is apolitical crowd, okay? But in light of recent events, I just have to get this off my chest. The Alex Bez situation. I made a video about it. You can go watch it. The same people who insist that we shouldn't use triggering words like slavery, rape, and holocaust, which accurately describe what we're doing to animals. Brand a guy as a rapist for inappropriate behavior that was objectively not rape. I can't. Posts like this really get under my skin. People like her have zero tolerance for any transgression, real or perceived, against a human with a marginalized identity. But meat eaters? Farmers? We gotta have compassion and patience. And this post, by an organization that I enthusiastically support and give money to, this is a safe space, and we do not tolerate, no matter how popular you are, trauma-inducing malignant behavior, definition rhetoric. We've continued to try to encourage others to make their social media a zero-tolerance space as well. These people and groups need to be challenged, and at a certain point, disallowed from all shared spaces online, and in the future at live events. Stop traumatizing your fellow activist. It's that simple. It's not that simple! What a ridiculously punitive and unreasonable standard. Am I allowed to disagree? Apparently not. Even though I'm a leftist and critic of white veganism, and agree with some of their points about Holocaust comparisons. How are we ever gonna have leftist unity? 
I do not feel welcome in spaces where I feel like I have to walk on eggshells. And that is the environment these people are creating, ironically named a safe space. And to clarify, I do not accept the right-wing narrative of cancel culture. Cancel culture is viciously infighting over small differences. It is woke scolding and policing others who are already largely on your side. Cancel culture is not ripping people outside of your community for their wildly stupid takes. For example, the late Michael Brooks was adamantly against cancel culture and sought to build leftist unity, but he was well known for ruthlessly dunking on Dave Rubin. I know I got some pushback for being mean in my response to Unnatural Vegan, but I don't really see her as a part of my community, because she's made it clear that she is not interested in debate or even friendly discussions with other vegan YouTubers. Her research is sloppy, she smears people, and she's a carnist apologist, so I felt justified in ripping her a bit. But you're right, I should probably reel it in a little. Thank you so much for watching, and big shout out to my new patrons on Patreon. I was honestly shocked. I thought that my channel was too small and no one would sign up. And also shout out to those of you who gave a one-time tip on Venmo. It was greatly appreciated. All right, peace out. Yo, how when me eat them, I wonder when me eat When me tell them, say me not eat no fish, no, no me now How when me eat them, I wonder when me yam When me tell them, say that I'm a vegan, man How when me eat them, I wonder when me eat